皆さんおはようございます。キーノートのお時間になりましたので、始めさせていただきます。Good morning, everyone. It's time for the keynote. まず最初に、本日のキーノートスピーカー、ブラント・ブーカーさんのご紹介をさせてください。ブラント氏は Python のコア開発者であり、現在は Microsoft で CPython インタープリタの速度向上を目的としたチームに所属しています。彼は2年以上前から CPython の開発に公式に関わっており、様々な方法で CPython の性能、安定性、表現力を向上させてきました。様々な方法で CPython の性能、安定性、あ、失礼いたしました。え特に、えー、昨年多くの時間を CPython3.10 の重要な新機能である構造的パターンマッチングの実装を設計し、リードするのに時間を費やしました。アットブラントブーカーとして GitHub に新しいコミットをプッシュしていないときは、コーヒーショップで深入りのエスプレッソをすりながらノンフィクションを読むなどして余暇を過ごすことが多いそうです。Let me introduce today's keynote speaker, Brant Booker. Brant is a Python core developer currently working at Microsoft on a team tasked with improving the speed of CPython interpreter. He has been officially Involved in CPython development for over two years now and has improved its performance, stability, and expressiveness in a variety of ways. Most notably, he spent most of the past year helping design and lead the implementation of structural pattern matching, a major new feature arriving in Python 3.10. When he's not pushing new commits on GitHub as at Brown Booker, He spends most of his free time at coffee shops sipping dark roast espresso and reading nonfiction. 皆様によりキーノートをお楽しみいただくために通訳機能のお知らせがございます。キーノートは Zoom の画面の下にあります通訳アイコンを押していただきますとお好きな言語でお聞きいただけます。You can choose the language to listen to the keynote speech. Click the interpretation icon. At the bottom of your screen and choose select the language. Please, uh, uh, Happy Omani, Sir Tashimasta, Mike Tesso, Kanete, Speaker, Ni, Yumiagi, Zeko, Yumiagi, Titakimas. Before the presentation, please go ahead to read the statement for a microphone test. Hello, my name is Brant Booker, and the title of my presentation is A Perfect Match. Uh, the design, history, implementation, and future of Python structural pattern matching. My presentation will be in English. The presentation materials are in English, and I will publish the presentation materials. I agree to having my picture taken during the presentation, and I will comply with the Python JP code of conduct. Now we are going to start Brandt's keynote speech. The title is A Perfect Match. Minasan Brant san o Discord de Hakshi de o Makai kudasai. Please welcome Brant with a pros on Discord. Thank you.、Uh, so, as we just said, my name is Brant Booker, and today I'll be talking about Python 3.10's new structural pattern matching feature. So, I'll start with an introduction,、uh, a little bit about me. I originally studied computer engineering in college,、um, but around my senior year, I first encountered Python and I, did, I learned that I liked、uh, software engineering a lot more than hardware engineering.、Um, I found and fixed my first CPython bug two years later, and a little over a year ago,、uh, I became a Python core developer. Um, my biggest project and my biggest contribution to Python has been the design and implementation of structural pattern matching, which is why I'm going to talk about it today.、Um, and I'm currently working on a team at Microsoft tasked with、uh, making CPython faster.、Um, I actually just started that job this week,、um, so I'm very, very excited to、uh, get into that. So, a high level overview of what we'll be doing today. Um, first, we'll cover the history of what led to structural pattern matching in Python. Then, we'll go over the design and how the feature uh, uh, actually looks in Python code. Then, we'll cover the implementation,、uh, what's actually happening when you run structural pattern matching code. 
And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the future, what we can expect in Python 3.11 and beyond. So we'll start with the history. Um, the history begins with switch statements. Um, you may be familiar with switch statements from other programming languages like C or C++. Um, it's basically a multi-way branch um, so that you can change the control flow um, based on the value of something, in this case, the size of a meal. Um, and for the last 20 years, people have been trying to add switch statements to Python. And those attempts have looked something like this. Um, and uh, this is kind of where pattern matching story begins. Pattern matching looks a lot like a switch statement. Um, it's very different, um, but it would be tough to discuss the addition of structural pattern matching to the language without first covering switch statements. And if you're not familiar with switch statements, um, basically they're equivalent to an if, elif, else. Um, where you just uh, check for equality uh, with one or more values and change the control flow based on that. So the first attempt to add a switch statement to Python came with PEP 275. And if you're not familiar with PEPs, it stands for Python Enhancement Proposal. Um, PEPs you may have heard of include PEP 8 or PEP 20. PEP 8 is a style guide for Python code, and PEP 20 is the zen of Python. Um, so those are examples of informational PEPs, uh, but PEPs can also be used to propose new features. And that's what PEP 275 did. Uh, it was called switching on multiple values. Um, and it was proposed 20 years ago for Python 2.6. Um, it had one author and it was pretty short at just uh, 1400 English words. It was eventually rejected uh, by the language creator Guido Van Rossum, the reason being that a similar PEP for Python 3000, PEP 3103, was already rejected. So this proposal has no chance of being accepted either. So uh, what was PEP 3103? Well, PEP 3103 proposed a very similar feature. It was called a switch case statement. And it was proposed five years later for Python 3. It had one author and it was about three times as long coming in at 4,000 English words. Um, this took a more holistic approach that considered several different switch case statement designs. Um, but ultimately it was rejected as well. Um, the reason being, and this is Guido Van Rossum speaking again, a quick poll during my keynote presentation at PyCon 2007 shows that this proposal has no popular support. I therefore reject it. And just like that, switch statements were proposed twice and rejected twice. So this is where structural pattern matching comes in. Um, and you may be wondering, what is structural pattern matching? Well, I can tell you what it's not. Structural pattern matching is not a switch statement. So it looks a lot like a switch statement. And in some cases, it behaves a lot like a switch statement. Um, but one thing that I really want to emphasize up front is that structural pattern matching is a lot more powerful than a switch statement. And in some cases, it behaves differently than a switch statement might in other languages that you may have experience with. Um, so I think that you owe it to yourself to uh, try to approach structural pattern matching with an open mind if you've seen switch statements before. Um, if you expect it to be a switch statement, you won't be able to harness its full power and you'll probably be frustrated when it doesn't behave the way you want. So if structural pattern matching is not a switch statement, then what is it? Well, it combines two ideas that were both that we're all very familiar with, um, control flow and destructuring. So let's take a look at what those are. Control flow is just branching in your program. Um, so in this case, we're branching based on the value of our entree. Um, if it's equal to spam, we print something. Otherwise, if it's equal to eggs, we print something else. Otherwise, we print something else. And if you're not familiar with spam, uh, it's a delicious canned pork product. I strongly recommend trying it. Um, so this is an example of branching based on a subject, but we can branch on more complicated things. Uh, so rather than the value, we can branch on the shape. 
And so what might the shape of a Python object be? Well, the simplest example would be the length of a sequence. So in this case, we're branching based on not the value of a sequence, but its length, whether it's equal to two, one, or something else. So that's control flow. What is destructuring then? Well, destructuring is taking complicated big data and pulling it apart into smaller pieces. And this too is something that we do all the time. Um, so one example that you may be familiar with is iterable unpacking. In this example, we take the first element of meal, assign it to entree, and take the second element of meal and assign it to side. But this isn't the only way that we can do destructuring. We might index into a sequence using integers. We might even index into a mapping using keys. And all the time, we uh, access attributes of objects using the dot notation. These are all examples of destructuring. And so structural pattern matching is just asking the question, what if we can branch while we destructure? What if we can destructure while we branch? And that's uh, where the power of pattern matching really lies. So this brings us to PEP 622. Uh, this was uh, the first pattern matching PEP that I was involved with, and it proposed structural pattern matching. Um, this was uh, last summer, um, and it targeted Python 3.10. Uh, there were six authors this time, so it was a very big project, and it was huge. It uh, was almost 13,000 English words. Um, for reference, this was the second largest PEP ever written. Um, and it was so large that it was almost unreadable. Um, if you were a user trying to figure out how to use the feature, that information was hard to find because it was scattered throughout this giant document. Um, if you were a decision maker trying to decide if we should even accept the new feature at all, um, then again, that information was really, really hard to find because it was scattered throughout the document. And so, um, uh, all PEPs um, for new features are approved or rejected by Python's steering council. And the steering council looked at this PEP and said, you know what, it's too big. Um, can you break it up for us? And we said, sure. And so that's what we did. We broke it up into PEPs 634, 635, and 636. So um, these were uh, published about a year ago. And there were three of them. Uh, PEP 634 was a formal specification for maintainers like me who are actually implementing the feature. PEP 635 was the motivation and rationale that contained the design decisions and uh, the rejected ideas so that uh, the steering council could make an informed decision about the feature. And finally, PEP 636 was a tutorial uh, that goes in depth into actually how to use the feature in your own Python code. And I strongly, strongly recommend that everybody here who's interested in structural pattern matching, check out the tutorial. Um, again, that's PEP 636. Uh, you can just Google it. Um, and it uh, really, really goes in depth in a very easy to understand way um, how to use pattern matching. And it's better than anything that I could show you here today. Um, that was uh, about a year ago and it targeted Python 3.10. And even though uh, it was longer at 15,000 words, it was now split into three documents, which was a lot easier to digest. And this was eventually accepted into Python. We also published a more formal academic paper. Um, some of you may find it interesting. Basically, pattern matching uh, has existed for over 50 years in functional programming languages, uh, but it hasn't really been done on this scale before um, with object-oriented dynamic languages like Python. So there was uh, you know, some novelty to what we were doing. Um, and so if you're interested on uh, how structural pattern matching in Python is essentially uh, matching a directed graph of objects in the Python runtime, you may also find that uh, paper interesting. It was uh, presented at the uh, Dynamic Language Symposium in 2020. So let's talk a little bit about the design then. Um, up front, 
the first thing I want to say is that if you're ever working on a project of this size and this impact, um, one of the best things that you can do and one of the earliest decisions that we made was to use a dedicated repository for all of our discussions and work. Um, this repository is still on GitHub. It's at G Van Rossum, that's Guido Van Rossum, the inventor of Python, slash Patma, uh, which is short for pattern matching. Um, and this repo was awesome. Uh, it gave us an issue tracker um, where we could discuss design decisions while actually designing the feature. Um, it gave us a collaborative environment where we could work on draft PEPs um, and other implementations early on. And it, it serves as a source of information. Most importantly, it's searchable. So if somebody like you is curious why pattern matching was designed one way or why we didn't include a certain feature, you can find the discussion there, um, including all of the different uh, uh, choices that we made uh, back and forth until we eventually settled on a final design. So I recommend that you check that out if you're curious about the process of how this was uh, built. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the syntax. Um, I know I've gotten almost a third of the way into the talk and I haven't actually showed you any structural pattern matching yet. So you're probably really, really anxious to see some. Here you go. This is a match statement in Python 3.10. And I just wanna briefly go over um, how it works. So um, it starts with the word match, as you can see there, followed by an expression that we call the subject. So in this case, it's just the name Neil, but it can be any expression, two plus two. Um, and that match header is followed by one or more cases. Um, so a case is just the word case, followed by a pattern. And in this case, the pattern is entree, comma, side. And one thing that's really important to understand is that patterns are not expressions. Uh, they're something that's entirely new to Python. Um, in fact, rather than building objects, patterns pull objects apart. So when we see entree comma side, we're not building a tuple using the names entree and side. We're actually pulling apart a two element sequence and binding the first element to the name entree and the second element to the name side. And if that pattern matches, then we execute the corresponding case block, which I've replaced here with just dot, dot, dot. So um, to kind of make it a little bit clearer how this is working, um, I will put the equivalent Python 3.9 code side by side. So you can see here how it works. Um, if the meal is an instance of sequence and its length is equal to two, then take the first element and bind it to entree, take the second element and bind it to side and execute the block. And you can see how the pattern version is much more readable, even if it does take a little bit of getting used to. Just like iterable unpacking, um, sequence patterns can be unparenthesized, they can be parenthesized. You can also use a square brackets, like a list notation, and they also uh, support star unpacking. So by adding a star in front of sides here, we're now saying that we'll match any sequence with length greater than or equal to one. And we'll bind the first element to entree and collect the rest of the sides into a list. And again, we're not actually looking up the name entree and sides, we're capturing them. And that's why entree and sides here are capture patterns. Um, they're actually storing the results inside of local variables, sort of like the left-hand side of an equal sign. We have other patterns too, and I'm gonna go over them here. Um, if I'm moving a little bit fast and it's hard to keep track of all the different patterns, that's okay. That's what PEP 636 is for. Um, but I do wanna give you an overview so that uh, you have an idea of how patterns sort of work and get a little bit of intuition uh, so that you can follow along with the rest of my slides here today. So the next type of pattern is called a wildcard pattern. And that just looks like an underscore here. It always matches um, and it doesn't bind any name. It's useful if you want to have a default case after all of your other cases have been tried, 
Um, but you can also nest it within other patterns, uh, which leads to some really powerful constructions. You can also put uh, capture patterns by themselves, so they don't need to be part of a sequence pattern. Here, uh, the pattern E will always match, and when it does match, it will bind the subject to the name E. We also have value patterns. And so value patterns are a way of matching based on the equality of an object. Um, so a value pattern looks like a dotted name. So notice that this is distinct from capture patterns. And this is a little tricky at first, but it's something that you get used to as you use structural pattern matching. Um, so if I have a name with a dot in it, like food.spam, it doesn't capture the name. Instead, it compares it equal. So here, this pattern will match if the entree is equal to food.spam. And this makes it really convenient to match based on the values of constants that may live in a class or a, uh, a module. Value patterns don't have to be dotted names, though. They can also be constants like strings, integers, floats, or booleans, or none. So here, we're just matching if entree is equal to spam. You can also combine patterns in many different ways. As we saw earlier, you can nest them uh, by putting capture patterns inside of a sequence pattern, for instance. But you can also combine them using what we call OR patterns. And OR patterns uh, use the vertical pipe uh, here to combine two or more patterns. So in this case, um, the pattern will match if the entree is equal to either spam or eggs. And you can nest these arbitrarily. We also have what we call AS patterns. And AS patterns look like this. You just add the word AS with a name. And that allows you to bind the subject to a name if it matches a pattern. So here, the spam or eggs sub pattern is nested within the as pattern. So here, if the result of calling cook is equal to spam or eggs, then we bind that name to E and execute the corresponding case block. So as I said, patterns can be arbitrarily nested. And you can see here how it becomes a very powerful way of exp uh, expressing complicated conditions. So while the Python 3.9 code on the right is almost unreadable, uh, the Python 3.10 code on the left, once you know how to read patterns, um, actually very clearly expresses uh, what it is that we're looking for here. Any sequence of length one or more where the first element is equal to spam or eggs, and we actually don't care what the rest of the other elements are. That's why we have a wildcard pattern here. And if it matches, then bind the first element to E. There are other types of patterns too. Uh, there are two more. We have mapping patterns, which look like dictionaries and match any mapping. So here we'll say we'll match any mapping that has entree and side keys, where the value for entree is spam, and then capture the value for side, as you can see in the equivalent Python 3.9 code. Again, this isn't building a dictionary. It's telling Python how you might want to pull one apart if it encounters one. You can also do star unpacking in mapping patterns. So here, if we find a mapping where the entree value is spam, then we collect the rest of the elements into a, a dictionary called rest in this case. And this rest won't include the entree. Finally, we have class patterns. And class patterns are really cool. They allow you to match against any kind of Python object. So what this is saying, is that we will match any instance of the meal class, and then we'll check its entree and side attributes. So if the entree attribute is equal to spam, then take the side attribute and assign it to side. And again, a reminder, we're not building a meal class here. We're telling Python how to pull one apart. It's much more efficient because we're not actually constructing anything at runtime.
we also have a uh, more uh, compact way of doing class patterns for things like data classes and named tuples. Um, this syntax allows you to match sub patterns positionally uh, rather than using the keyword syntax that we saw in the previous slide. This is a little more complicated, uh, but for things like AST nodes, uh, it makes the resulting patterns a lot cleaner and a lot easier to read when the position of the sub patterns is implicit. And then finally, we also allow guards. So guards can be put after any pattern and it looks like the word if followed by an expression. So in this case, the expression is side is not none. So this case will match if the pattern matches. And then after the pattern matches, the case block will only be executed if the captured side is not none. Um, if the captured side is none, um, then we don't actually execute this case. We continue trying uh, cases that come after it. And you can put any expression here. So that's really powerful because you can make your patterns as dynamic as you want them to be. And so it's easy to see here how uh, pattern matching is capable of taking really, really complicated conditions and presenting them in a very easy to understand way. Um, I won't go through this entire code here, um, but it basically allows you to match against any sequence, uh, mapping, or point class that encodes an X and Y coordinate. And you can see here that we're using all of the patterns um, I just went over, including guards on the last case. Um, the equivalent Python 3.9 code would just be too complicated to include here. The, the slide isn't big enough. Um, and so that just kind of illustrates the power of uh, this new feature when used correctly. And you can also see how it's much, much more expressive than a switch statement. And one thing that I want to highlight is that um, we didn't really invent any of this. Um, structural pattern matching has been around uh, primarily in functional languages for uh, over 50 years. And so a big part of our design process was figuring out what we liked in other languages and what they did well. Um, to illustrate that, I have an example here. This is a simple recursive factorial function. And what it does is it matches a parameter n. If n is equal to 0 or 1, we return 1. Otherwise, and you can see we're using our wildcard for our default case here, we return n times the recursive factorial. Um, so not only is this very succinct, but it looks a lot like structural pattern matching in other languages. So here I put it side by side with Scala and Rust, which also have pattern matching in their syntax. Um, and it's very clear uh, where Python draws its inspiration from. Um, and if I go so far as to reformat the Rust and Scala examples to match Python style, you can see that they share many of the same building blocks. One of our goals when designing this feature was to make sure that people coming from other languages would find Python's structural pattern matching syntax very natural. Um, and same for anyone going from Python to other programming languages. Um, there was no need to reinvent what other languages had been doing well for so long. But, it's very clear that of these three examples, the one on the right looks and feels the most like Python, which was equally important to us. So that's the syntax. Let's talk about the implementation. Um, this was a big part of uh, what I contributed to the project. So I'm really excited to kind of share how pattern matching works and what it actually does when you execute pattern matching code in Python. So um, my work was on the structural pattern matching compiler, or as I like to call it, the spam compiler. <laughs> um, some quick stats on this. Um, the uh, implementation of structural pattern matching in Python uh, was written in six different programming languages. Uh, Python itself was written in C, 
Uh, the tests are written in Python. Um, documentation is written in a markup format. Um, and we have other languages that we use to generate the parser and compiler. Um, it was a huge project spanning about nine months. Um, and all in all, I touched about 24,000 lines of code in CPython's code base. So easily my biggest project ever. So let's go over what the compiled bytecode looks like. And if you're not sure how Python actually works or you haven't heard the word bytecode before, that's okay. This isn't something that you need to understand in order to use structural pattern matching. Um, but I do think that it's really interesting. So that's why I'm going to take the time to go over it today. So when you run Python code, it gets compiled to bytecode. Um, and bytecode is similar to assembly language, like you might find uh, in uh, the compiled output of other languages. So before looking at how this match statement is compiled, let's look at how the equivalent Python 3.9 code is compiled. Uh, in order to view the bytecode, you can import the built-in dis module, D-I-S, and call it on either a function or a string containing Python code. So if you call it on this Python code, you get the following output. And this is the bytecode that Python executes at runtime. They're small atomic instructions that uh, implement your program. So we'll walk over how this works. Python uses a stack-based virtual machine, um, which basically means that each bytecode is responsible for pushing data onto the stack or popping data off of the stack. So when you execute this Python 3.9 code, this is what happens. First, you look up the name is instance and push it onto the stack. That's the first bytecode, load name is instance. Then you load two more names, meal and sequence. Then you call a function with two arguments by pushing three items off of the stack, calling them, and pushing the result back onto the stack. The next instruction, pop jump if false, pops an item off of the stack, and if it's false, will jump somewhere. Here, it'll just jump uh, to the end of the code. Um, and so uh, in this case, if it's not a sequence, it'll jump to the end of the code. But it, if it is a sequence, then we continue executing. Mm -hmm. Then we load two more names, Len and Neil, call them, load the constant two, compare the top two items on the top of the stack for equality, and then pop jump if false again. If we've gotten this far, then it means that we have a sequence of like two. So we load the name meal, unpack the sequence into two elements, store the first item to entree and the second element to side. And that's how Python executes your code. Um, you can see that it is uh, quite complicated um, and there's a lot going on here. So let's compare that to the generated bytecode for uh, Python 3.10's match statement. Okay, so we're going to uh, look at this bytecode, but right off the bat, you can see that it's a lot shorter. It's a lot more efficient. Um, and part of that is, is because Python's compiler can do more work for you up front since it knows more about the syntax. Um, you might also notice some new instructions here too. Um, so we'll go over those as we work our way through. So just like before, we load the name meal. Then we execute the match sequence opcode. And what this does is it performs the sequence check um, in a much more efficient way than actually looking up as instance and calling it. Um, in fact, due to an optimization made by my colleague at Microsoft, Mark Shannon, um, this is blazingly fast, way faster than you could ever write it in your own code. And again, that's just because the compiler has more knowledge of context. Then we pop jump if false. Then we call the get len opcode, which 
pushes the length of the meal onto the stack. Again, this is highly optimized and it's much more efficient than actually looking up the len function and calling it at runtime. Then we load the constant two and compare it like before. We pop jump if false. And then finally, just as before, unpack the sequence and store the entree and the side. So you can see that the code is much more efficient, not only in the number of byte codes, but also the implementation of each byte code. And hopefully this section gave you a little bit of an idea of uh, how Python works. Um, I think this stuff is super interesting. Uh, I look at it all day, which is part of why I think it is interesting. Um, but I think it's uh, uh, you know, good to have an idea of uh, what is actually being executed when you write your code. One other detail of the implementation that I want to share today, and my favorite part of the implementation, is something called soft keywords. So soft keywords are super cool. Um, and I actually can't take credit for them. Um, they were written, uh, they were the first code written for structural pattern matching. Um, and it was written by Guido Van Rossum, uh, one of the collaborators. And as I said before, the inventor of Python. So I think soft keywords are best illustrated with an example. So you may be saying, Brant, I've got a ton of regular expression code that parses strings and uses the name match. Um, is this going to break now that match is a keyword, just like case? Um, and the answer is no, your code will work uh, just as it did before. Um, and this is because Python's parser was rewritten to be much more efficient in Python 3.9, um, but also much more powerful. And so I kind of want to show how that works here. So this code is essentially matching uh, a feed from your local law enforcement against a regular expression and uh, offering hot takes on the state of current investigations. Now, this code is a perfect candidate for refactoring uh, using the match statement. And that looks like this. So it's a lot more readable, even though it looks a little bit weird. And yeah, it looks weird, but it does work. Um, and the reason it works, as I said before, is because Python's parser can tell when you're using the words match and case as keywords like dev or class um, or as identifiers. So here, everything in red is an identifier and everything in blue is a keyword. And Python's parser is smart enough to distinguish the two because it's never ambiguous which one you meant. So soft keywords are very, very important because without them, this would be a breaking change. Anyone who used the match or case keywords um, would suddenly be unable to run their code. But because of soft keywords, we're able to uh, guarantee that this new huge feature is totally backwards compatible. In fact, if you have code that runs on Python 3.9, it will probably run on Python 3.10. Um, you may just need to download some newer versions of any dependencies that you have, um, but the code itself shouldn't need to change. And that's important to us. So that is basically it for the implementation. The last uh, bit of time that I have here, I want to spend talking about the future. So uh, everything that comes after this will be uh, new features that uh, me and other people are working on for Python 3.11, um, which is due out about a year from now. So the first thing that I'm currently working on is improved control flow for match statements. Um, and again, I think this is best illustrated with an example. So in this code, um, I'm just going to walk through what the code is doing. So if the meal is a sequence of length two, where the first element is equal to spam, bind the first element to entree and the second element to side. Otherwise, if meal is a two element sequence with the first element equal to eggs 
then bind the first element to entree and the second element to side. Otherwise, if a meal is a two element sequence, bind the first element to entree and the second element to side. And the way that Python executes this code at runtime is actually very similar to the way that I just verbally explained it. It does a lot of redundant work. You'll notice that uh, by the end, we had checked whether meal was a sequence three times, and we had checked its length three times. Um, and that's really inefficient. So what might be more efficient is to realize that we're always checking if it's a sequence of length two. And if so, we're always binding the first element to entree and the second element to side. And only after checking that, do we need to uh, bother checking for either the string spam or the string eggs. And to show how Python 3.11 is able to optimize this, I want to show you the equivalent uh, code that Python 3.10 generates. So this is the equivalent code that Python 3.10 generates. And you can see all of that redundant work that we're doing. And so as good Python programmers, we might be looking at this and saying, well, Brant, I know how I would rewrite that if I saw this in a code review. I would rewrite it like this. And indeed, this is what uh, hopefully Python 3.11 will be able to do. Um, it will be able to uh, rewrite the logic to only check the bare minimum required conditions for each case. And that's a really powerful optimization. And this optimization, if you're curious, is called decision trees. Another really cool improvement uh, actually comes as a consequence of the decision trees, and that's called improved reachability checks. So again, I think this is best explained with an example. So let's say that you have two constants, spam and eggs, which are bound to the strings spam and eggs. If you want to match against these, you might write a pattern matching block like this. But does anyone see the bug? I'll give you a second. Again, this is a, a easy beginner mistake to make. Um, these are capture patterns, not value patterns. So this is not checking whether entree is equal to spam. It is binding uh, the entree to the name spam which means that the first case will always match and the following cases are unreachable. And this is enough of an issue that it was important for us to catch it. So in Python 3.10, we made sure that this is a syntax error. And the way to actually fix this is to turn your capture patterns into value patterns. The easiest way to do that is with a class. So by putting the spam and eggs into a food class or into a module of constants, you can then match on those value patterns instead. And this will work as intended. But Python 3.10 isn't actually smart enough to catch uh, all the different ways that this can happen. So for example, consider this code. This has the exact same bug. You can see that rather than checking if the first element is equal to spam or eggs, we're actually capturing it into the name spam and eggs. And again, Python 3.10 won't be able to catch this for you, which is unfortunate. But Python 3.11 will be able to if we can get this optimization into it. Um, and the reason for that is made clear when you look at the rewritten efficient decision trees. 
So this is the code that Python 3.11 would generate for the previous match statement. And you can see that it becomes obvious that the second and third cases are unreachable because the first case will always match. And so Python 3.11 will be able to catch this and issue syntax warnings, letting you know that the second and third cases are unreachable. And this can really sneak up on you. It's not only through inadvertent capture patterns that some patterns can become unreachable. For example, Let's say that I have a cutting edge piece of technology that checks whether a number is divisible by three or five or 15. This is one possible implementation. Does anyone see the bug? I'll give you a second. So the bug is that the third case, the fizz buzz case is totally unreachable. The first case matches anything that uh, ends with zero, and the first and the second case matches anything that starts with zero. So the third case, which matches anything that's zero and zero, can't possibly be reached because it's shadowed by the first and second cases. So Python 3.11 will be able to catch this for you, and the fix is simple: just reorder your cases because they are tried from top to bottom. And um, this can hide in even sneakier ways. Um, I have one more example for you where maybe we're parsing a JSON payload. So in this example, um, just to walk through it verbally, um, they're all matching a mapping with a meal key. And matching uh, the value that is a sequence of length two. So the first case matches any sequence where the first element is spam or any sequence where the second element is spam. The second case matches any sequence where both of them are spam. And the third case matches everything else. And maybe you've seen the bug by now. It's the exact same bug that we saw in the fizzbuzz code earlier. The first case makes the second one unreachable for the exact same reason. Again, Python 3.11 should be able to catch this for you. And again, the fix is simply to reorder your cases. And that's it. If you're curious to learn more about structural pattern matching in Python 3.10, as I said before, I strongly encourage that you check out PEP 636. Um, it's an awesome tutorial where you get to build your own role-playing game um, and walk through all the different ways that uh, structural pattern matching can make your code easier to understand and to read. So my name is Brant Booker. I'm a Python core developer. I can be reached on GitHub or uh, here on uh, Discord for PyCon JP or on the Python Discord um, as at Brant Booker. And you can also email me at brant at python.org and let me know what you think of structural pattern matching. Thank you very much. So now I think I'm going to take some Q&A from the Discord. Is that correct? Yes, you're right. Branto-san, happy, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. So we start a 10 minutes Q&A now. If you have any questions, please put it in the Discord channel. 質問は日本語でも英語でも大丈夫です。Please write question on the channel on Discord, prefixing them with question or something like that at the beginning of your question, which makes it easier to pick questions. The questions can be written in Japanese or English. Um, また質問を... 
Yes. Uh, sorry, I, go I ahead. forgot. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yes. Uh, uh, just a brief note. Mata stumo wo eran de kimasu no de kite mi tai stumo gareba, ano zehi thumbs up mark wo tsukete kudasai. Please vote the question with the thumbs up emoji to make me pick questions. So I already saw uh, one comment that somebody had saying that uh, PyLamps in VS Code um, can already catch the reachability issue. And that is true. Um, so linters uh, like PyLamps, or I think MyPy is also adding this feature uh, in the next week or so, um, can check things like exhaustiveness and reachability um, uh, statically, which is really, really cool. Um, but not everyone uses linters, so it's you know just as important for us to make sure that you can't accidentally make that mistake at runtime as well. But yeah, I strongly encourage using this feature uh, with static type checkers. Um, together, they're very, very powerful. Right. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, eh, there's still time, so if you want, we'll continue. 質問の方お待ちしております Okay, I think uh, there is another person is making a question I see an English one um, Yes <laughs> How hard is it to be a Python core developer and to be able to realize this feature? Um, so I was involved in Python core development for um, over a year, about a year and a half uh, before I became a core developer um, and I actually became a core developer as a result of my work on this feature um, I like to joke that this feature would not have been possible without the coronavirus because um, it took a lot of time and energy, but ultimately I was stuck at home in quarantine um, and needed a project to work on. So I had uh, a lot of free time to be able to work on this, um, hundreds of hours ultimately. So it's not easy, but I really enjoy doing it. And if it's the sort of thing that you really enjoy, then it doesn't feel all that hard either. Yes, perfect. Uh, how about another question? I think Emu-san also asking, how did you feel when your PEPs got accepted? Yeah, um, it, it was great. Uh, it, there was a lot of hard work that not only goes into designing the feature, um, but also making sure that it gets accepted. You have to convince a lot of people that this is a good idea. Um, and a lot of people don't think it's a good idea or think it's a good idea, but want it to look different or work different. And so there was a lot of uh, discussions uh, in public on mailing lists or on GitHub um, that were interesting, but very, very exhausting at the same time. And so when the feature finally got accepted, um, I think I was more relieved than happy. Um, I got time to be happy later, but it was nice to know that that uh, big, big project was finally over. Um, someone else uh, had a question about type checking since we're on the subject. Um, yeah, MyPy and PyLance will narrow types in match statements. So again, PyLance is already uh, shipping this feature. I think MyPy, um, I, I looked at the PR this last week and it looks like it's in the final stages. They're just working out a couple of exhaustiveness issues. Yes, thank you so much. And let's see if there are more questions uh, on I Discord. See, I see another one. Are all keywords yes. now soft keywords? Uh, the answer is no. Um, so you can't start calling your variables def or class or if. Um, soft keywords we think need to be used sparingly, um, mostly because the code can become very unreadable if you start using keywords as um, uh, identifiers. And so soft keywords are really uh, meant for preventing backwards compatibility issues like we saw here. Um, rather than just making it so that you can call your variables if. I think we would need uh, a, a much better reason to turn them into soft keywords than that. Um, I yes, see another sir. one. Does match uh, not return a value? Yeah, so if you're familiar with pattern matching in uh, functional programming languages, uh, you might expect it to be an expression. 
Um, and originally, we tried both out. We tried it as an expression and as a statement. Um, but because of the way Python is designed, um, the statement just fit into the language much more naturally. So no, it doesn't return a value like it might in Rust or Scala or Haskell. Um, it is a statement uh, similar to if, elif, else. Um, and if you need an expression, it's not too hard to just put a match statement inside of a function and call the function instead. Um, ultimately, Python's indentation style just wasn't very expression friendly. Thank you so much. Uh, seems like we missed one question. Maybe I can uh, show you. Uh, if the match match is okay, the match case should also be okay. もしあけてみます。今もう一度質問の方を繰り返していただいてもよろしいですか。はい、えっとですね。much, much case, if much, much case is okay, uh, much case, much case also works. That was, the, I think, the question in Japanese. Yeah, that sounds impossible to translate. Um, <laughs> right. um, yeah, it, it, it is fine. So my example did match, match, and case, case, but match, case, and case, match also work. Okay, that I wouldn't good. encourage it, though. Right. Um, I think there are another English question as well. I think this will be the last one. If you can see this, you are allowed to match, uh, uh, allowed to write much, much. Can you also write too much? Oh, I think oh, someone I translated think so. for us. Yeah, we've got some helpful people translating for us. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, I think. Um, yeah, I think we can pick another last question. Let's see, uh, we need to hear the translation too. So there might be a little bit time lag in between, but let me read this up. Uh, it seems like uh, this is more powerful than if, but uh, is, is there a possibility that the match is going to be used more than if in the future? No, I don't think so. And the reason I think that is um, just because it, it, it's not what you need in most circumstances. So I like to say that the most important word in structural pattern matching is structural. So most of the time when you're doing control flow, you're branching based on a value. Um, structural pattern matching is only really helpful if you're branching on the structure and you want to actually destructure the object. Um, and so while we do that all the time, it doesn't fill the, the need uh, that uh, if else does so eloquently already. Um, and if you look in other languages with pattern matching, you'll see that if Elif else is still very, very commonly used. Yes, thank you so much for answering the questions. Uh, 時間になりましたので、ここで機能と終了いたします。発表本当にありがとうございました。参加者の方はディスコードで発表者に大きな拍手をお願いいたします。We are out of time. Uh, we are going to end the keynote here. Thank you so much again uh, for giving a keynote speech at our conference, PyCon JP 2021. Everybody, please give a big round of two applause to the speaker on the Discord. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you. And uh, if I didn't get to your question, just at mention me on Discord. I'll, I'll try to get to it by the end of the morning. Thank you.